few days ago, millions of us in this country gathered around tables laden with much food. And perhaps one of the things that happened was that we uh, took time to think through what are we thankful for? What are we grateful for? As I was checking out the Thanksgiving Facebook messages, I saw lots of folks giving thanks to their families, their friends, a lot of folks saying thanks to God for various things. People giving thanks for living in this country, for their good health. But I didn't see a single place with someone saying, thank you for my suffering, my trials, or for my hardship. That did not come up in my Thanksgiving prayer at my house either. When we think about things we're grateful for, we tend to think about things that make us feel good, alive, and warm, comfortable. We don't think about things that tend to make us feel afraid, anxious, broken. And yet the Bible does share that there are folks who did just that. The book of Acts shares about a time when some folks gathered not around the Thanksgiving table. They were gathered in a room trying to stay safe from the Jewish leaders. Following the resurrection of Christ, they were the first apostles. And the book of Acts again shares a time when some of the apostles had healed somebody and began to evoke a great following amongst the people, and the leaders were upset about that. And so they had the apostles arrested, and they had them beaten, and they, they threatened, don't ever talk about Christ again. The disciples refused uh, that threat, refused to comply. They went back to their room with other followers. And the book of Acts says this, that the apostles left the Sanhedrin, the, the gathering of religious leaders, rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering for the name. They were thanking God that they had been deemed worthy of suffering in their discipleship. Probably a decade later, a man named Paul, another apostle in the early church, wrote in the book, Letter to the Romans, he wrote these words. He says, we glory in our sufferings. What a phrase, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Hope does not disappoint us. No one in the Bible ever prays to suffer. That would be masochistic, unhealthy, and certainly not in line with God's will. But when suffering happens, they're able to see it in a certain way that Paul says produces eventually this reality called hope. That suffering could be a portal crossing, a way to move into this reality called hope. The Bible also says that hope, along with faith and love, are meant to be seen as God's three greatest gifts, but hope, I think, has a distinctive quality to it because it often gets forgotten and is remembered only in times of trial or sadness or grief. For example, I have hope, indeed, that Christ has been raised, that the resurrection is real, and that we shall be raised with Christ, but that hope becomes something very poignant and central when I'm doing a funeral service. When my own parents die, when loved ones have gone to the next life, there's something about facing the reality of death that makes the hope of eternal life even more crucial and poignant, perhaps. So hope tends to come out in times where there is suffering, confusion, or hardship, to turn our hearts and our minds towards God. In our next scripture reading, the Apostle Paul is going to be helping us to think through the necessity and the, the source of this great gift that we call hope. Listen now for God's word to you as I share a portion of Paul's letter to the Romans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, or who hopes for what is seen, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. May God bless to our hearing and to our living this reading from God's holy word. So now that we have Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, Small Business Saturday in our rearview mirrors, and Monday coming up, uh, Cyber Monday approaching tomorrow, we are certainly launched now into our frantic Christmas preparation. 29 days until the big day arrives, if I'm counting correctly. So there'll be a lot of shopping, buying, lists to be made, parties to attend, things to do. It would be a very frantic, busy time of year. Well, Pope Francis was pondering the way that the world tends to approach Christmas, and he shared these words. He said, Christmas is approaching. There will be lights, parties, lightened Christmas trees and manger scenes. It's all a sham. The world continues to go to war. The world has not chosen a peaceful path. There are wars today everywhere and hatred. We should ask for the grace to weep for this world, which does not recognize the path to peace, to weep for those who live for war and have the cynicism to deny it. God weeps. Jesus the Pope wrote these words seven years ago, but they seem pretty timely today. In some ways, it sounds like maybe the, the Pope here is channeling Ebenezer Scrooge. Christmas, humbug, lights, parties, it's all a sham, he said. But maybe the Pope's got something more in mind than simply trying to rain on the, the joy of Christmas. Maybe what the Pope is trying to do is to get us to think through what is the true purpose, the meaning of this birth of Christ? What kind of a world is Christ now still trying to redeem and to make whole? And how, are, especially those of us who call upon Christ as Lord, how are we to approach what's happening in our world right now? That maybe singing fa la la's and being upbeat and happy all the time, maybe the Pope suggests maybe it's a, a diffusion, deflection. Maybe it's a way to stay distracted from what's really happening in a deeper way in our world. A way that we might join with God and Christ to grieve and to weep. It does seem like a very festive thing to be joining in with. And yet perhaps the Pope is pointing us to a fact that Paul mentions in our second scripture reading where he says, you know, all the world is groaning. The world is suffering. The world is giving expression to its hardships and its struggles. So the world back in Paul's days, like in ours, was a war-filled world. The Roman Empire was constantly engaging in one military enterprise after the other. People were hungry, starving. They were marginalized people. There were systemic inequities. The world and the people were groaning under the weight of living in a world of brokenness heaviness, and of human uncaring. And yet Paul says this world in which we are living is also a world that has something within it that transforms the suffering for those of us who have faith in Christ. He says the world really is groaning, but he makes it an analogy to the pains and the, the sufferings that accompany childhood. I still can recall pretty vividly when my own two children were born. I was in the delivery room with Jennifer. Because the delivery was going quickly, she had no chance to have painkillers or an epidural, so it was all natural. And I'd never seen my wife in such discomfort or such pain, never heard her say the things that I heard her say on that day. <laughs> and yet if you were to ask her now, of course, was it worth it? She said, of course it was worth it. 
The suffering was indeed worth it because of what came through childhood pain. That what was emerging was indeed worth every amount of suffering. The Apostle Paul says something very similar. He says, you know, life is hard, there's struggles. Friends betray us. Jobs get lost, cancers get diagnosed. Things happen that make this life sometimes heartbreaking, tragic, sorrowful. And yet he says all of it still has this dimension that there's a reality called Christ at work in it all that transforms it into something that's not meant to end or to be felt primarily as something that is tragic or as something that is redemptive. Something has happened through Christ that has allowed the suffering to be impregnated with hope. For Paul, the place where hope infused the world was through the reality of Jesus Christ. The arrival of Christ in Bethlehem, the ministry of Christ in Galilee, the crucifixion of Christ in Jerusalem, and the resurrection of Christ outside of Jerusalem, Paul says, gave the world this reality that God had made a choice, that God had infused the world with the reality now that could never, ever again be destroyed. The Christian gospel brought to this grieving and groaning world this promise, historical event, that God had come to us through Christ in a way that said, I will transform all of this now through my son in a celebration of the fact that life is indeed the most powerful and the real thing of all. As Christian people, we do say that hope comes in the morning, that hardship and strife are short-lived because God is stronger than darkness. And that through Christ, God has said a yes, a yes to hope and promise to all of us, to all of creation through the reality of Christ. The gospel brings this sense of promise and hope, not as a wishful thought, but as a historical reality that Christ died, Christ was raised, Christ is Lord of all. And for the Christians, that is upon the foundation upon which all of our hope rests. And Paul is telling us, therefore, that when we see the world through Christ, when Christ is the lens, when Christ is the understanding, the matrix through which we look out now from our place of faith, we begin to see not just suffering and despair, we begin to look for the reality of this Christ at work in our world, and it transforms how we see things transforms what we are anticipating. It gives our heart the sense of possibility, of hope, even in the most dire of circumstances. Victor Frankl was a man who lived, I think, in probably the most desperate of all human situations. He was a concentration camp participant. He was imprisoned by the Nazis and he found many, many people dying of despair in those camps. He wrote a book called Logos Therapy, and in, in this book he writes these words. He says, if there is meaning in life at all, then there must be meaning in suffering. The way in which a man accepts his faith, fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which she takes up her cross, gives ample opportunity ample opportunity, even under the most dire circumstances, to add a deeper dimension to life. Even in the most trying of circumstances, life may remain brave, dignified, and unselfish. Or, in the bitter fight for self-preservation, he may forget his human dignity, become no more than an animal. Frankl says that there is meaning in life, there must be meaning in suffering, because life, as we know, is infused with suffering. The Apostle Paul knows not just that all creation groans, but we groan. We groan sometimes by seeing our own frailty, our own compulsions, 
the ways that we often hurt those we love, and we groan because we know that's not how we want to be, that's not who we're meant to be, and yet, yet that is what's happening. So Paul says, all creation groans. We groan to be set free from our own limitations, our own brokenness. We long to live in the freedom and joy of the children of God. And perhaps you are aware of that. You know, sometimes the holidays make us aware of that so profoundly, poignantly, when we gather together with families, we have such a hard time really being present, being loving, something within us that tends to resist the impulse of love. And Paul says, so we groan for that too. We long to be set free. Creation longs to be set free from what's oppressing it. And yet Paul says, we, we have this gift in Christ to hold all of that in reality of hope. Because Christ is with us in all of it. And one of the most Beautiful parts of that passage that Paul says, even Christ's spirit groans with it. Christ is groaning as well, the fulfillment of what Christ initiated in Bethlehem, Jerusalem. That Christ is groaning for wars to end, for starvation to be no more. Christ is, is groaning to see the end of oppression, of racism, and patriarchy. Christ is groaning to see the world emerge in the fullness of what he came to bring forth. And so there is this holy communion that takes place when we approach the suffering in our own hearts, the suffering of the world, the suffering of God, in a way that allows our hearts strangely to be edified even in the most darkest of times. Come to the table this morning, a table that really took place on the eve of a horrendous injustice few hours before a brutal death was to take place. Christ took this, these elements of bread and wine, says, it's my body broken, it's, it's my, bo my blood poured out. But then he said, and I will not drink again of this table until we drink together anew in the kingdom of God. Even in this meal, Christ was saying, this is moving towards a day. And all of us shall sit together and celebrate the fulfillment of God's purpose that I bring into the world. We hold that hope in our hearts always. Today as we come to this table, we are invited to share in that sacred and holy communion of our groaning, the world's groaning, and the Spirit's groaning, together in this deeply sacred community. May we hear and feel the reality of Christ's presence. We live in a world that is hurting, broken. May we be given the hope, joy, to live with purpose and possibility. Thanks be to the Christ who comes to us, who dwells within us, and who leads us forth. And it is to this Christ that we give all praise and honor and glory today, tomorrow, and indeed throughout eternity.